think we are live. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to November Movie Reviews with Brent and Frankie on Frankie Sense and More. Hello everybody and welcome to the show. We Hi everybody. Are, we're <laughs> with our wonderful movie critic Brent Marshall who is coming to us live from Chicago and I'm Frankie coming to you from Toronto. So let's hit it. What's happening in November? Yeah, well, we're we're, we're coming to you uh, early this month because of the Thanksgiving holiday next week. We figure you'd probably be more interested in stuffing your face with turkey next week than listening to us. So but we wanted to get some new movies in that there are there are some good things out there right now that are worth seeing. And we're going to start off with with the movie that is like on everybody's mind right now, which is Black Panther Wakanda Forever, uh, the sequel to the original uh, Black Panther movie, which came out in 2018. The, the filmmakers really had a challenge coming up with this, given the fact that the star of their franchise, Chadwick Boseman, uh, passed away after just doing only one film. And it's kind of hard to build a franchise when you don't have your lead character there anymore. Uh, also, they really had a challenge with where do you take the story if you don't have your protagonist with you anymore? Uh, but the the filmmakers, particularly director and writer Ryan Coogler, really, really came through on this one. They came up with a storyline that, frankly, I found more interesting than in the original picture. But also, they were doing, they're having to work with creating a story that was going to serve as a bridge to the future if they want to keep this franchise going. And again, they succeeded very much on that point. And uh, third, they really wanted to do a fitting tribute to Chadwick Boseman um, because he was somebody who was grossly underlooked by Hollywood in terms of recognizing his talent. And uh, this movie really comes through on that point in terms of paying tribute to him in a way that's reverential and not the least bit exploitative or sensationalist or anything like that. Uh, I really have to commend Marvel Studios with their handling of this because this was a film where it really evokes emotion, mm -hmm. not just for the character, but also for the actor as well. And, you know, you may even find yourself in your, while watching this where a tear or two comes to your eye. I mean, it really is that powerful and that moving of a picture. Uh, how how often can you think of a cartoon or not not a cartoon, but how often can you think of a comic book movie doing something like that? You know, they really they really did a great job. Um, and on top of that, you know, it, it's got a lot of really strong attributes to it. The the cast that really has taken over the franchise, at least for this film, as a bridge, um, has you know they turn in tremendous performances. Letitia Wright. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o and especially Angela Bassett. I mean, they're all just top notch across the board. And, um, you know, I, I really can't say enough good things about this film, even if you're not necessarily ordinarily a comic book film person. Yeah, this one, this one will touch you in ways that movies of this genre typically don't. Uh, Chadwick's last movie was it Big Mama Thornton or something? That was he played? It was um, 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 Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, where he he finally received an Oscar nomination for his performance in that and ended up somehow losing out. I mean, I yeah, that was that was a uh, quite an embarrassing moment for the Oscars broadcast because they saved that award until last, and then when he didn't win they really had major egg on their face. Um, personally, my favorite performance of his was as soul singer James Brown in Get On Up, uh, which he wasn't even nominated for, which that just still to this day baffles me. Um, but in any case, this film really, it really comes through. And it, it is a, a fine example of uh, going against what Martin Scorsese said about cartoon about, about uh, comic books not having any artistic merit to them. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Um, this shows that these movies can break out of that stereotypical cookie cutter mold 
and do something more. Yeah. Um, this one, um, in, in many ways, probably reminds me more of like some of the James Cameron movies, like The Abyss and Avatar and things like that. Um, that's that's one of the few problems I had with this film is that some of the uh, cinematic illusions <laughs> and uh, production design were a little too similar to some of Cameron's films. Um, but, you know, beyond that and beyond the movie being maybe just <laughs> yeah, yeah, that and, and also the film, the film could have been a little bit shorter. I mean, it's like two hours and 40 minutes. And I think they could have cut it down probably by about 20 minutes. It wouldn't have lost a lot. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I mean, I really can't find fault with anything else about this film. So I recommend this one very highly. What are you giving it? I'm giving it four and a half stars. Ooh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Where are we going? Okay. So next, we're all we're dealing with another very powerful film. Uh, it's fact based, based on an incident that took place here, in, unfortunately, here in the U.S. Uh, back in the 1950s, and that's the film Till. Yeah. Uh, this film tells the story of uh, a ch Chicago teenager named Emmett Till who went to visit his relatives in Mississippi in the, uh, 1955. And while he was down there, he was lynched and killed for having whistled at a white woman. He was 14 years and, old. Uh, 15, yeah. But basically, um, he thought that he was paying the woman a compliment, and she obviously took it the wrong way. And her husband and uh, a lynch mob went after him and killed him. And they ended up... Um, you know, shooting him in the head and beating him up and dumping his body in a river. It was recovered several days later and it had become they bloated and him. mangled and virtually, right. you know, virtually unrecognizable. Um, but his mother was insistent upon the world seeing what these people did. Yeah. So she insisted on having an open casket. Uh, there were pictures that appeared in the press, including the Chicago Defender newspaper and Jet magazine. And then she also went and testified at the trial to um, validate the fact that, yes, indeed, this was his body because the defense team was trying to say, well, you, you can't pin this on these people because it was mangled beyond recognition. This was actually a, a very seminal moment in the civil rights movement. Um, it was beginning to get off the ground to begin with, but this really kicked it into a higher gear because of the power of this story. Uh, his mother's insistence on doing these actions really changed a lot of minds and really got things moving. Um, it's hard know, as a mother not but, to feel another mother's pain. And absolutely, so yes. And it's, it's such an interesting story in so many ways, you know, he would eventually, you know, he was hung and, and, and his father was hung. His, yeah. his real father was hung, although he did do some bad things. His child did not, nothing bad. The, the uh, perpetrators of this crime were obviously in Mississippi were let go, even though there was, you know, enough evidence to convict them. And then to top that off, <laughs> you know, uh, they confessed to the crime after because they know double jeopardy, they're not going to get they're not going to yeah. be again. And 75 years later, the woman who was whistled at or whatever, touched or whatever it was that this young man did, confessed that he should never have been killed for anything like yeah. what he did to her. And then they they found out that the FBI had evidence, you know, against her and never brought it to court. And they wanted to charge her recent in 2000, I think this year, 2022, they were going to charge her. Um, and Mississippi, they they did not nah, let it go, even though she she admitted that she was wrong to have charged him. Yeah, and actually, uh, the the in the film, the testimony that she gives in court differs from what was actually depicted yeah. in the incident when it took place in the film. On okay. top of it, how do you live with yourself for all those years, knowing that you just destroyed a young man, destroyed his family? You know, like I don't even understand why anybody would live in this. So backward. Sorry, well, the, people, but. yeah. I mean, I mean, the one thing that uh, the one thing that the film does show is that even though things may not be perfect now, 
they have come a long way since then. And, you know, it's... Um, the fact it's they wouldn't even consider it now? Yeah. I mean, asked? yeah. I mean, it, it's it's it certainly shows that we have made progress in moving things forward, even if we haven't necessarily reached the ultimate goal that we're striving for. You know what? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna accept that testimony. We're going to charge you, but we're gonna let your seventy five. We're just gonna let you know yeah. be on uh, parole or something. But at yeah. least the action was taken to say, yeah, we were wrong. Well, and the, and the one thing that that if you know there is any kind of good thing to come out of something like this, it ultimately resulted in the passage of the Emmett Till anti lynching law. True. That's true. You know, and that just it I, took it took a long time for that to happen. It just happened this year, and this incident took place in 1955. So I mean, you know, it's I mean the wheels of progress are slow at times. It's yeah. <laughs> not to do that, to take a lot of your own hands and do horrible things to other people. Now, the one thing, uh, the there are a lot of really good things to like about this film in terms of the, the period piece. Production values are top notch. But most importantly, the performances are just absolutely outstanding, particularly the actress who plays uh, Emmett's mother, uh, Danielle Deadweiler. She is considered a very, very strong front runner for the Oscar for Best Actress. Yeah. And I think she really deserves it. I mean, she is just so powerful. And this is a great showcase for her. She has done other movies and TV shows, but nothing that's ever really been terribly prominent. This really is a breakout role for her. Um, and I really hope at this point that she at least gets nominated, hopefully wins, because her performance is just so moving and so powerful that she really deserves the award for her performance here. Uh, now, one thing I do want to caution viewers on, this is a hard watch. This was the kind of film that there was no way that they could water it down to make it more palatable, given the way the story unfolded in wow. real life. They okay. be discussed. Now, yeah, now it, it's not... I wouldn't call it gratuitous and I wouldn't call it grotesque, but it's certainly disturbing. And viewers really should be prepared for that going in. If that kind of, if that sort of thing really bothers you that much, then don't see it because, you know, it's just going to bother you too much. Yeah. I mean, you know? I read some reviews where people were like, oh, you know, they shouldn't make movies like this or, or, you know, this is really hard to watch. It's like, but that's why they make movies like this. Yes. And it had to be truthful to the story. I mean, if they started diluting it to make it more palatable, yeah. well, then the impact of what the story was all about to begin with would be lost. Exactly. You know, so I have to commend them for having the courage yes. to proceed with something like that, especially for something that is going to be going into, you know, a mainstream yeah. movie house uh, released by a mainstream distributor. Uh, for to you know have that kind of effect. Yeah, I think one thing that did help it is it, uh, one of the supporting roles in the film is played by Whoopi Goldberg, and she was also a backer of the film. This is something that's obviously very near and dear to her own heart, and um, I think that helped to carry some clout to move the project forward and to help it get you know more of a wide uh, wide distribution. Yeah. So that's that certainly helps and. Um, she gives a fine supporting performance in the film as well. She's a good actor. Yes. So uh, I give this one four and a half stars. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. Four and a half stars, guys. Uh, <laughs> I'm being generous today. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next up, uh, in a very different turn, we have uh, a film called Triangle of Sadness. And this has been kind of a... Uh, sort of a sleeper success in many ways. It's the kind of film that you wouldn't necessarily think would be terribly popular with audiences, especially mainstream audiences. But at least, um, at least here in the U.S. and particularly here in Chicago, where I am, uh, this is getting a lot of play. It's it's been out for a while now, and um, it's playing in a number of theaters. And oh, wow, what a strange movie! But it's really, a really funny. Movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is a film that basically, uh, you know, it's a socio-political commentary 
on the relationship between the haves and the have-nots. And uh, you see the uh, a group of one percenters who are on this luxury cruise where anything that could go wrong essentially does. And suddenly they become very dependent upon the crew who they often look down upon to basically save their behinds. Um, this movie gets huge, huge laughs out of a lot of um, sight gags and situational comedy. You know, not having to rely on one-liners to get your last is a, a tricky, you know, prospect to try and do. But that's very typical of this particular director. He's a Swedish director named Ruben Oslund, who's who's done um, other movies kind of in the same vein. Um, one was called Force Majeure, and another one was called The Square. But this one, I think, is probably his best. Um, it's just really outrageously funny and you find yourself laughing at a lot of stuff, really belly laugh nature. I mean, look at Woody Harrelson, you know. surprising role. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, he's really very well cast in the part because um, he plays a, the captain of the yacht and he spends most of his time drunk and locked in his cabin. Um, but, you know, when you, when you look at the way that the, the message that this film is trying to deliver, um, it's giving you kind of a statement on our times at the moment. Um, you've got a wayward yacht, which is sort of, you know, very symbolic of the ship of state, shall we say, of the current society. And you've got a drunk at the helm. You know? <laughs> I mean, what more can you say? I mean, <laughs> you know? uh, it's really a, a perfect metaphor. Um, and, you know, when you meet all of these one percenters, they're just like off in their own little worlds, clueless, totally lost. Um, and you see, in addition to a lot of the arguments related to economic inequalities, you also see arguments related to gender inequalities and social inequalities and, you know, the amount of um, status and influence that people were able to have. I mean, one of the people who is on this boat, who is being exalted for her prowess is as, as a social media influencer, which I think is an absolutely inane, you know, type of profession to begin with. I but, like people go, I'm a social media influencer. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? I mean, what the hell is that? I know you. <laughs> I've never heard of uh, So, uh, this is this is hilarious. Um, now, the one thing that I, I should caution people about is it is a little bit long. It's it's another one that's about two and a half hours, which is really kind of unusual for a comedy. But it's not terribly unusual for this particular director to do a film of that length because he wants to definitely get as much in uh, as he possibly can about the messaging he's trying to to deliver to viewers. So, but you know, it's it doesn't seem like it's that long because you're spending so much time laughing yeah you know i mean uh, it's it's really it's really hilarious so I, I recommend this one again you know very highly and uh if you can see it in theaters you know by all means try and see it there while it's still there because uh it looks good on a big screen it's it's interesting also and in the fact that the uh, where they filmed this movie uh the yacht itself uh, it was a boat that was one time owned by Aristotle Onassis. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of an interesting little irony <laughs> involved in, in the backstory <laughs> of the production. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's funny. All right. So this one gets uh, this one gets four stars. Okay. And we need a little laughter in our life right now. Yes. So next we have the latest film from the acclaimed Mexican director, uh, Alejandro Iñárritu, uh, and that's called Bardo, uh, False Chronicle of a Group of Half-Truths, which is a rather lengthy title, but then he's known for having movies with very lengthy titles. Um, this one is, um, it's been called a vanity project because in many ways, this is almost an autobiographical film um, telling his story about having been uh, kind of praised yet often criticized for being the kind of filmmaker that he is. He's very flamboyant. 
Um, he doesn't always follow the mainstream. Uh, he was, um, I guess, born and raised in Mexico, but has really done most of his work outside of Mexico in the U.S., and he's often been criticized for that. Um, and you have a central character in this film who is in many ways based very much on who he is. Um, Bardo, for those who aren't aware of it, is the, uh, the, the place or the state of mind that some Buddhist schools of thought refer to as the place where you have uh, the, the world between worlds. Yeah, sweet. And, uh, reborn. Yes. And essentially, um, the lead character in this film, he's a uh, respected journalist and documentary filmmaker who finds himself in situations that seem to be kind of surreal. And he finds things going on around him that he doesn't quite understand. And he also finds himself uh, examining issues that he's never really given a whole lot of thought to, like his relationships with his co colleagues, his relationships with his family. And as these keep going on, he's beginning to get a sense of what exactly is this that's taking place here. And what you could say is that in many ways, it's sort of typical of what a lot of spiritual schools of thought talk about when they talk about the life review that people go after they pass on. And he gradually comes to understand what he's doing there, why he's going through what he's going through and taking a hard look in himself and back on his life and you know, what do I want to carry forward as I move forward to whatever comes next? Um, this film is another long one. Uh, it's about two hours and 40 minutes. And from what I understand, it was actually cut down by about 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, and that's, for me, that's actually probably the biggest problem with the film is that it, it it's just too long. I mean, but then again, as, as a vanity project, it's going to be self-indulgent. And you're going to say, that, I got to get it all in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this is, this is the director who made the film Birdman and won an Oscar. And he's done a lot of other fine films like, you know, Babel and 21 Grams and The Revenant. And he probably figures, hey, I'm like almost 60 years old myself. I owe it to myself to be a little self-indulgent. Well, that's fine. But I mean, that. It's not necessarily something that everybody's going to want to see. Yeah. And in particular with this film, the, the, the first hour really drags a little more than it needs to. But once you get past that point and you come into the second half of the film, then it really starts to come together better. Um, that's about the time that you see the protagonist starting to understand what's happening to him. And that's when it starts to get really interesting because now he's interacting with his own review and beginning to see firsthand exactly what these things mean. So it's a very interesting film. I, I, I would give it three and a half stars. If, it, if, the, first, if the first hour had been, had been stronger, I probably would have given it a higher rating. But it's, it, the first hour does take a little bit of effort to get through because it's a little bit slow paced. Uh, the film is currently playing in very limited release in a number of cities, uh, but it's a Netflix production, and they kind of always release their movies that way, where they put it in theaters for a very limited time to start with, and then they put it on the, net, the Netflix network and uh, make it available for streaming. Yeah. This is supposed to become available for streaming um, on, I believe it's December 16th. So consider this sort of a preview. Uh, you know, a film that's getting ready to go wider starting next month. Um, there's a lot of interesting things in terms of the way this movie is shot. Uh, the one thing you, you can't fault this director for is um, he's a master technician when it comes to a, being a filmmaker in terms of knowing how to uh, shoot scenes, uh, how to stage them with uh, the production design. And he, he really like takes the lid off with this one in terms of some of the absolute absurd creativity that you see displayed here. You saw some of that in Birdman, but you see it to a much greater degree in this film. Um, so uh, again, my feeling is um, you can make it through the beginning, 
you know, wait for the second half and, and you'll enjoy it a lot more. If you're going to sleep, sleep in the first half. Thank yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, I, I should be, I should be a little more um, clear on that too. It does have a very strong beginning. It's it, when you get about maybe 15, 20 minutes into it, that's when it slows down okay. and it slows down for like the next 40 minutes or so. But after that, that's when it picks up again and, and moves on. So he brings it home. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. And, and our, our final new film for today is actually not all that new. It was made in 2017, but it's just recently become available for streaming. It's a Ukrainian film called Falling, a uh, film from a director named Marina Stepinska. Um, this film was made um, before the war. And it was trying to depict what a lot of the young people in Ukraine were going through in the time after the 2014 revolution. Um, people who are essentially kind of looking for themselves in a society that was at the time believed to finally be breaking free of a lot of uh, overpowering influences um, primarily from uh, the Soviet Union and then from Russia itself, uh, and also uh, among its internal government. Um, but without having never really had an opportunity for the people to be completely fully free and on their own, they're almost kind of somewhat directionless. And they're trying to find themselves. They're trying to find who they are, what they want to be. As all young people are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think also the fact that, you know, they've been thrown into this situation where they've, they've never had the opportunity to experience this before. They really don't know what to do. And um, as the film plays out, it moves a, a little bit on the slow side, but it's like watching a mystery unfold in terms of understanding what the two protagonists have gone through what they're going through and what they may be headed toward. So she was um, living off with her other boyfriend, with a boyfriend? To yeah, she was living with a boyfriend who was from a journalist from Germany who was there to cover the revolution. Um, and he's getting ready to move back to Berlin now. And she's kind of on the fence about what she wants to do in terms of whether she wants to go with him or wants to stay with him. And the other lead character is somebody who is something of a mystery. Um, he's uh, uh, got the reputation for having um, been an aspiring musical prodigy, but then just sort of walked away from it. And you're not really clear exactly why that happened. Uh, he's ended up um, going to live with his grandfather, who is an old school um, uh, former Soviet citizen who's adjusting to life on his own. And now he's having to, you know, sort of take care of his grandson who he worries about as maybe being kind of borderline unstable. Yeah. Uh, and then these two people meet and they form a sort of bond, kind of a tentative relationship of sorts. But again, you know, it's sort of like the blind leading the blind. Each of them is off on their own direction and they're trying to figure out, you know, who do I, who do I turn to and what do I do as I move forward? So uh, some of the relevancy of this film is probably no longer there, given the fact that this was made before the war with Russia started. Obviously, you know, if anybody who's living there probably does have more of a purpose now than they might have had when this was made. But it doesn't change the fact that, you know, it's still telling kind of a universal story, as you mentioned, that this is something that all young people go through to a certain extent. Uh, and they're doing it under very unusual circumstances. Really, again, I mean, you, you had a war, everything is disrupted, chaos is, is there. And there, what will I be in my own country? What country will I do my, my thing in? Where, what will I become? It's, things are so unstable and so unsettled, you know. Uh, so many questions, more questions than answers for young people, really. Exactly. And, you know, one, one of the things that's important is that, it, that this film, like a lot of other Ukrainian films that have maybe not received a lot of attention prior to this point, are starting to service to show exactly um, what an incredibly turbulent decade yeah. these people have had 
you know, first of all, with the with the internal strife with the with the maiden revolution in 2013, 2014, and then you know having to recover from that, and then now face the war with Russia, and you know, I mean, I mean, talk about being put through the ringer. It's just in, incredible what the people of this society have had to endure. Much more than I think most people outside of Ukraine are really even aware of. Uh, but these films help to bring all of that to light. And I think that's important to see that um, this is a society that's really struggling to find itself. And, you know, not only just in terms of its mere survival, but also in terms of what's next. I mean, what do you do for the future? Um, so this one, it, this one is a good film. It, it receives some recognition at the Cannes Film Festival in 2017. And I'm glad to see that it's finally available now. And I would give it three and a half stars. Cool. And it's available for streaming. Yep. Um, so that's the, that's that's where you can catch it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So those are our new movies. I, I do have a few uh, little announcements I want to add before we close out today. Um, one of them is the fact that a movie we reviewed last month, uh, Moon Age Daydream, the documentary about David Bowie, is now available for video on demand and on Blu-ray. Awesome. So if you didn't get a chance to see it in theaters, um, now you have a chance to stream it or own it. And it's well worth it. I recommend this very highly. Great, Great documentary. You gave it a five, didn't you? Yeah, I gave it a five. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it's really um, quite, quite good. Um, so next, I also wanted to uh, let viewers know that I, I just finished streaming the St. Louis Film Festival, and I, my, I have a blog that's gone up uh, that has uh, reviews of the eight films that I watched. And one of the films in particular that I watched uh, that you just had the, uh, there we go, just had the poster up for, uh, is a film that I think is really worth seeing, and I, I recommend it this because film. it. Yeah, this is this is playing at a number of film festivals. So if you have a festival coming up in your area, you might want to check to see if this is on the schedule for it. It's been playing at quite a few other festivals to this point, and it's going to be playing at some more. And their website keeps viewers up to date on where it will be playing. It's called A Crack in the Mountain. And it's a film about a, um, a cave in central Vietnam that's believed to be the world's largest cave system. And since it's been discovered, people have been wanting to flock there to go see it for its tremendous beauty. I mean, yeah. subterranean, subterranean river and cathedral ceilings and uh, an internal waterfall. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and, the, and the film really captures the beauty of this film quite well. Uh, unfortunately, because it's become so interesting to a lot of people now, it's also being threatened by... Us. You know, being over, yeah, by us essentially be, being overrun by tourism and you know, uh, economic development in the surrounding area. And it's it's an area of Vietnam that was particularly hard hit during the war. So there's been a lot of effort to try and stimulate the economy and and get jobs there for people who haven't had it either at all or for a very long time. And they, they see the cave as a, a way to do that. But unfortunately, you know, what happens when conflicting interests collide? And that's what this film does a great job of depicting, showing how, how do you balance sustainability economically and environmentally? Yeah. So um, I this is... environment wins. <laughs> yeah, well, I do too. Yeah, and, and, you know, they, they do see... They're, there are some efforts underway to really and truly try and do that. But by the same token, you know, it's like a, 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 a pristine area that you just cannot wait to go and wreck, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's, a, you already know what we're going to do to it. We wrecked earth already. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's almost like, you know, trying to, trying to rein in the investors and the government is like trying to, you know, corral a Mustang that yeah. wants to just break out, you know, because they do see the economic potential. And, and even, even the environmentalists are willing to concede that. They're saying, you know, we can understand where 
yes, this is a resource that people should be able to enjoy and should be able to get some benefit from. They don't deny that. The question is, how do you go about it? Yeah. How do you do it in a way that is not going to ruin it? And this film raises all these arguments and does a great job in terms of presenting the views of all sides. So if it's at a festival in your area, I really strongly recommend go see it. Um, this was um, one of the best films I saw at the St. Louis Festival, and uh, I'm really glad that I had a chance to see it. It's also the first uh, film to be made by this particular director, and he did a great job, so I really can't wait to see what else he comes up with next. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let me wish you a happy Thanksgiving. That's oh, thank you. We, we <laughs> in Canada have our Thanksgiving when it's the harvest season. <laughs> <laughs> As when you came to America, I guess. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm glad we were able to get this in so that, you know, viewers could see a few things to watch on Thanksgiving if they have the opportunity.